Good morning, good morning. Uh, Turn to Romans chapter 13, that's where we're going to be. Clyde kicked us off last week with our new sermon series about being set free, about being set free. And um, I'm looking forward to going through this series. Uh, We are going to talk about something that uh, I'm sure everyone really loves, and that is politics. Yes, politics. It's the most exciting thing that you could ever discuss, right? Yeah, not. Uh, But believe it or not, the Bible has a lot to say about governing authorities, um, about authority in general, but also about uh, specifically kind of what we're going through right now as a nation. Obviously, it is election year, and I don't know about you, but I am completely tired of watching um, ads on TV, uh, the debates stress me out, um, watching them go back and forth, and it's like a reality TV show gone wrong. Uh, it's like a car accident, too. You just can't turn away, and so you have to watch the whole thing. But uh, I don't know if you've got uh, interested in what's going on with our nation and selecting our next president. Um, I don't know what your experiences have been in the past with uh, governing authorities or law enforcement, but my first experience that I ever had with getting in trouble with the law was when I was in the seventh grade. And as a seventh grader, there was this really big thing uh, for us was TPing people's houses. If you don't know what TPing people's houses is, it's when you take toilet paper and you throw it all over their house. And uh, it can be a very um, cool and fun thing to do for a nerd like me in the seventh grade. But at the same time, it's against the law. And uh, I was staying over at my uh, friend's house. His name was Luke Brown. And I can tell you right now, if you went and asked them about this story, they would be able to recall it like that because something happened that forever impressed their minds. So we, we were staying the night at his house. And he goes, hey, we should go TP this girl that he liked. And she literally lived all the way across town. I mean, it was a hike. So at 1 o'clock in the morning, you know, he's wanting us to go TP their house. And so, um, of course, you know, I don't want to do that because I'm a law-abiding citizen. And uh, totally influenced by other people. I had nothing to do with this decision that was made. But I decided to go along with it. And so we walked clear across town. We TP'd this girl's house. We also put shaving cream all over the place. And uh, we were completely completely ridiculous. I mean, it was ridiculous. And if I had a son that did that, uh, I would have spanked his butt because that is wrong and messed up. So on our way back, right, on our way back, all of a sudden, it's one o'clock in the morning, you know, you get all nervous. And when I get nervous, I have to use the restroom. And this was not a good situation because we're outside and all of our toilet paper is gone. So we're walking down the road, right, like complete fools. It's three o'clock in the morning. We're walking down the road. We don't really understand what we're doing as far as being in trouble with the law. We're just ignorant. And so I'm like, look, I've got to go. And so I decided to use the restroom. I had to go off in somebody's yard. I had to use leaves. It was not a good experience at all. And they, will, they can recount this story for you, I promise you. Uh, and I was completely humiliated and embarrassed. Well, finally, you know, we get finished up and we're walking down the street and then we see a cop car. He's coming right at us. What's the natural thing that you do, right? Yeah, we ran. So we're running away, and then I stop because I'm chubby and I can't keep up. And I'm like, let's just, let's just turn ourselves in. So I stop, and I'm breathing. Cop car pulls up, and he is just reaming us out. You know what I mean? If anything gets broken into, you know, you're going to be responsible. Put us in the back of his car, and I am really scared. I am really scared because I realize I am in trouble with the law. He takes us back to my friend's house, knocks on the door. My dad ends up coming over completely angry and upset with me, and I get punished and disciplined. It was a terrible experience. That was my first experience getting in trouble with authority. And uh, speaking of using the restroom, you know, these presidential debates have a lot to do. You guys didn't get that. But these presidential debates have a lot to do with authority. And how we view authority. You know, how should we view our next president, even if we disagree with them? How should we view the the law of the land if it's something that we're not necessarily for or something that is against our religious values or something that is against our moral values? How do we handle that type of situation? Our leader is going to dictate that. But more importantly, how we view our leader reflects our relationship with God. The Bible says this in Psalms 146, do not trust in princes or in mortal man in whom there is no salvation. When we talk about the idea of politics or law, we really need to approach it with the mindset that our trust, our hope, our safety, our joy should not be put in the government. However, whoever we select as a leader, 
whether it's at the local level or the national level, uh, it really does impact us, and we should do everything that we can to influence who that leader is going to be for a, a moral and a righteous leader. Proverbs 29 says this, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. When the wicked rule, the people groan. Moral integrity and having character is something that we should value and vote for and look for in our government leadership, in our church leadership, and the leadership of our households. Dr. Jack Cottrell writes this about government authority. He says, civil government is inherently good, but it can be corrupted just like any other institution. If it becomes perverted to the point that it requires us to do something, contrary to God's revealed will, then we must obey God rather than man. Governmental authority is binding upon all citizens, but it is not absolute. And that should set the tone as we read through Romans chapter 13, as we talk about this idea of government, that it deserves our respect, it deserves our submission, it deserves our influence, but it is not our ultimate rule of authority. It does not dictate what we do in life ultimately. God does that. That is God's position. But more importantly, Paul does discuss how God works through those things. And there are two words that I want you to take away this morning. As we talked about what it means to be set free in the realm of politics and governing authorities and how that applies to us personally, the two words that I want you to take away this morning are simply this, submission and living as strangers. Submission and living as strangers. So if you look at Romans chapter 13, verse 1, that's where we're going to start out. Now, Paul is inserting what what is called a parenthetical interjection. In Romans chapter 12, he just got done saying, you have been set free, you have been renewed, you have been transformed by the renewal of your mind in Christ Jesus. And because Jesus has transformed you, because Jesus has set you free from your sin, it should influence and impact the way that you live. How you live, the decisions that you make are influenced by what Jesus did for you on the cross and how he saved you. And he talks about living this transformed life in the church and how you should use your gifts to serve God and be involved in the church life and how God ultimately has authority in your life and you should trust and follow him. And one of the ways that he talks about what a transformed life looks like deals with Romans 13, what it means to obey and submit to governing authorities. So make that connection. A transformed life looks like serving in the church and following God and being different, but one of the parts of a transformed life is being set free as a citizen. So he says this in verse 1, every person, every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. So the first word that we're looking at this morning is submission. Obviously, in verse 1, he uses the word everyone. This isn't just for Christians. This is for uh, the world at large. This is a general moral rule given by God to his creation that we all should follow. And he says everyone should submit to authorities, right? The word authorities here, it's in the plural, and it has the idea of the right, the power, the authority. It includes the concept of this, telling others what to do and the right to enforce it through power. But this word authority is governed, or excuse me, is modified by a word. And it's modified by the word governing authorities. And that's how we know that he's specifically talking about civil government, law, and living this transformed life. This word uh, governing means to be in high position. Um, It's distinguished, obviously, from other types of authority that we find in life, such as church authority or the husband and wife authority. And he says, what do you want to do to this governing authority? Well, it's our key word, submit. And it has this idea, to obey, to subject yourself. Um, it, It means, Dr. John Murray wrote it like this in his commentary on Romans, it implies obedience when ordinances should be obeyed. But it also includes, and this is kind of something that we probably all struggle with, it also includes the attitude of obeying. You see, think of it like this. Parents, 
If you have a child, right, that you've told to do something, hey, go take out the trash. And he's like, oh, I don't want to take out the trash. I hate my life. I don't know why I'm the one who always has to do this. And he gets up and he grabs the trash and he takes it outside and he comes back and he says, I hate you. And he runs up to his room. Is that the type of authority that you want your child to have? Absolutely not, right? You want your son not only to do the act, but also to have the attitude. Think about also church membership, for instance, right? As leaders in the church, you don't want church members who will say, fine, if I don't get my way, then I just won't be involved. Fine, if I don't like it, then I'll just, you know, check mark off coming on Sunday morning and I'll totally be withdrawn. No, what do you want? What does God want? He wants action and he wants attitude when it comes to submitting to authority. And so that's, that's what Paul was talking about here in verse 1. He is talking about submission to, to governing authorities. And then Paul tells us why, right? He tells us why. And he says this, because God is the author and the idea of authority. Something that we really need to clarify this morning is this. Some people take this interpretation to mean that God directly places people in political positions to rule. So God has placed Hitler, God has placed Stalin, God has placed our future presidents and our past presidents in those positions because that's what God's will is, is to do. And I don't agree with that interpretation. Jack Cottrell does not agree with that interpretation. How we should ap- approach this passage of scripture is this. God is the author of the idea and the concept of authority. Authority is a good thing. Think of it like this. God is the author of the concept of marriage right? God created and instituted marriage. Now, because we as creatures mess up marriage, does that make marriage a bad thing? No, it does not. Because we as his creation might distort the idea and the concept of marriage, that doesn't mean that marriage is a bad thing. So God is the author of authority. Authority is put in place for a reason that we're going to find out here, and it helps us live and be set free not only from our own sin, um, but also in a way of life that is very applicable to us today. So we have all different types of authority, right? Paul says this, obey governing authorities. Why? Because God is the author of authority. You see the link there? And there are different kinds of authorities that we could talk about. The man-woman relationship in the church as far as teaching and preaching. We could talk about the husband and the wife relationship in a marriage. We could talk about the parent-child relationship, which I mentioned briefly. We can talk about leader uh, and congregational membership in the church. We could talk about your work. The Bible has this master-slave idea um, and and following your masters um, when you're employed and, and you have a job. But more specifically, the context here talks about civil authority. So if God wants you to obey the law of the land, and the law of the land says, do not consume this narcotic, what does that mean? Do not consume this narcotic. We should obey that. If the law of the land is don't drink until you're above the age of 21, that is something that should be obeyed. Maryland has a law that says parents who host lose the most. And so parents who allow their children to consume alcohol or marijuana or other illegal drugs, they're in violation of the law. How about taxes? Oh, man, that's something we all love, right? Everybody looks for an excuse not to pay taxes. It was one of the highlights of the presidential debate. Um, and he said, look, I've, I've obeyed the law. <laughs> I, I've followed the law. Um, so who cares whether or not I've paid taxes or not? Um, and, but, but it's important for us to pay taxes according to what? According to the law. How about speeding limits? Oh, yeah. I sped on the way to church. Did I break the law? Yes. Did I get caught? No. (laughs) Everybody does this. Uh, I don't care who you are, unless you're like a super saint. Everybody probably breaks the law of speeding at one point in time, right? And what happens when you pass a cop? Your stomach gets upset, your heart sinks, even if you are going the speed limit, right? You're still driving behind the wheel and you're like, oh my goodness, why is he following me? Why is he following me? Do not follow me. So you'll slow down to like 35 miles an hour, hoping that he passes you by. We all get that. And this is, this is why, right? This is why. Look what Paul goes on to say here. He says in verse two, therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God and they have opposed Um, God's will, and they will receive condemnation upon themselves. The reason why we get sick every time we pass a cop is because we're, we're lawbreakers. We mess up, don't we? We make mistakes. And that is how God instituted governing authorities. He wants that to take place. 
because governing authorities should have this Greek word called phobos. What does that sound like? Phobia, right? There should be a reverence and a fear for people uh, in law or in governing authorities. Why? Because it is a form of deterrence. The law was trying to deter us from doing evil, and that is a healthy form of fear. Now, there is also an unhealthy form of fear, which we'll talk about here in a few moments. But these violent protests that take place across our country, damage, rioting, violence, fighting, terrible injustice, it is not God's will. It is not God's plan. The looting that took place in Baltimore, that was not God's will or God's plan. There is such a thing as civil disobedience. And remember, I quoted Dr. Jack Cottrell at the beginning, where it is better to obey God than man. And I can promise you right now, our pulpit will always speak the right to life and stand against abortion, no matter what the law of the land states. When it comes to God's design for marriage, right, our pulpit will always speak the word of God, how it's between a man and a woman. There are certain things that we will not bow to when it comes to certain uh, religious teachings that we find in the scriptures. And we could go on and on. But what's important to understand here is that God's will is that he works through governing authorities to bring about his will. Look what it says in verse 3. He says, after opposing authority is opposing God because God's the author of authority, he says, for rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior. If I'm driving the speed limit and my vehicle is registered and I am okay 100%, I should not be in fear, right? Because the law punishes evil, not good. And look what else he says here. He says, do you want to have no fear of authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For it is a minister of what? Of God for you to do good. But if you do what is evil, be afraid. For it does not bear the sword for nothing, for it is a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath on the one who practices evil. Now remember, we are talking about an idea here. We are talking about in theory that God created governing authorities to function by punishing evil, by preventing evil, and promoting good. But what happens? Government gets corrupt, right? People make mistakes. And, uh, and it is not God's plan. But before we get to some of those things, Paul introduces the reason here. Here are some good reasons why you should obey governing authorities. The first one he said in verses 1 and 2, because it comes from God. God ordained governing authorities. Number two, he says, for fear of punishment. Obey governing authorities because if you do not submit to them, you will be punished. The authorities exist, like I said, to promote good and punish evil. Uh, And he inserts that word terror there, which is reverence or respect. If you do this, this will happen. But Paul also asks in verse 3, do you want to live without being afraid of civil authority? Then do what is right. So here we have civil government promoting what? What is righteous, what is good, what is holy. It should reflect God's character. So we're talking about this idea of being set free, right? Uh, Clyde talked about last week being set free from your sin and and living in the freedom of walking away from who you used to be and to the glory of who God has called you to be. And civil authority helps you do that. Obeying the law helps you do that. It promotes you to do good and it prevents you from doing evil and it serves as that type of deterrence. But what about when government authority goes wrong? What about when you have a a, a police officer who shoots a man in the back who's running away from him, who is unarmed? That man deserves to be punished. I can say that there is no worse thing than being subject to a person who has authority and power and manipulates and uses it for their own personal good. And they are in direct violation of God's purpose and plan for governing authorities. The police officers, the civil servants, the President of the United States, church leadership, husbands and wives, anybody that manipulates their power and uses it and abuses it for their own personal gain or for evil deserves to be punished. And that comes from God. You see, as Christians, we have to respect and look up to our government to lead us in righteousness and in justice and good. But we are just as evil if we sit back in silence 
against corrupt politicians or corrupt government and authorities. The Bible calls us to be standers for truth to be uh, voices for righteousness and civil disobedience that has taken place over the course of this country from however many years is a good and righteous thing. Why? Because it is better to obey God than man. Now, of course, we can't have anarchy and chaos, right? So we must reject any type of satanic influence or injustice and the way that God wants us to do that, right? That's what God's will is for our lives. Look at Romans chapter 12. This is within the the context of what we're talking about this morning. In Romans chapter 12, verse 19, it talks about this idea of taking vengeance, right? So, for instance, I'm sure many of you know, the police officer who shot that unarmed man running away from him, right, obviously broke the law, lost his job, deserves to be taken to a court of law for what he did. That was wrong, right? But what should we do? Should we take personal vengeance against this man, Should we take the law upon ourselves and act in such a way to carry out our own justice? Well, look at what Romans chapter 12 says about this in verse 19. He says, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. It is God's will to punish wrongdoing through civil authority, but it's also God's will to punish wrongdoing through eternal damnation. You see, if I take vengeance upon myself, I'm taking God's place. That's why God instituted governing authority. So therefore, those who abuse power deserve to be punished, but those who break the law deserve to be punished. We should be standing up against those who seek to corrupt and destroy our communities, our school systems, our families through sinful influence. So there is a balance we need to walk hand in hand with a good, righteous police officer who is struggling and fighting to protect our community. And on the right hand, we need to walk with the people who have been abused and damaged by those who have abused their power. And we need to join together as a church, as a community, as a, a faithful Christian, and leading the charge for what it means to be righteous and holy, what it means to be set free from the world's way of doing things and following after Jesus. Peter has something to say about this. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. And Peter adds to what Paul is saying here. Um, and it's really important to have this perspective because we need, to, we need to see the entire counsel of God's word when it comes to dealing with governing authorities. Look what he says in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of what? Evildoers. And the praise of those who do, do right. Government's role is to promote righteousness and to punish evil. He says in verse 15, For such is the will of God, that by doing right, this is where it really hits us, we may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as what? Free men. And do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves to God. This is where we make our transition. To submit to God is to submit to governing authorities because it speaks a very loud gospel message that if I can bow to governing authorities, I bow to a governing king. His name is Jesus. If I can obey the law, I can obey God's laws. And so this idea of civil authority and government and doing what is right is much bigger and much louder than just obeying the speed limit. It's much bigger and much louder than just making your vote and choosing a president. When we obey the government, we are speaking a powerful message to the people around us. Those who reject God, those who are promoters of evil, those who persist in doing injustice, when they see our lives and being set free from sin and being set free from the way that the world does things, when they see us, it should point to Jesus. It should point, as Peter says, to the glory of God. And so here's a key phrase that I want to focus in on, is that your submissiveness to authority is a part of God's plan for your life, and it portrays his righteousness to those around you. How you respond to authority ultimately really reveals how you you respond to God. And you know what? Submission is hard, man. It is hard. Submitting to God or in marriage or in church 
um, or to governing authorities, it is not easy. Why? Because we're sinful people. We mess up. We make mistakes. And so in this idea of submission is this overwhelming theme of this, our second word, live as strangers. Go back to Romans chapter 13, because this is strange, right? This is strange doctrine and strange teaching, and people in the world don't live like this. Paul says in this idea of submitting to governing authorities, he says in verse 5, Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection, not only because of wrath, but also why? For conscience sake. In other words, we shouldn't obey the law just because bad things might happen. We should obey the law because we have a conscience. We know what is right. We know what is wrong. He says in verse 6, For because of this you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. It's clear cut. Sorry, folks. Got to pay our taxes. I know. I know. It's terrible. Verse 7, Render all to him what is due. This idea of governing authorities. Tax whom taxes due. Custom to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. Honor to whom honor. Owe, no one, uh, owe nothing to anyone except what? Love for one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, and therefore love is the fulfillment of law. Man, if we could all start living more like strangers rather than citizens of the United States of America, our lives would be transformed. Our communities would be transformed. You see, because Paul was saying the key to being set free from your sin is being set free and loving without conditions. I mean, think about this. Christians love their president regardless of their political position. We might not agree. We might stand against there may come a time where we have to civilly disobey, but Christians show love to, the, to our neighbors. People who do wrong, people who break the law, the commandment is this, you should love, but why? Why do we do this? Why do we love? Why do we obey the law? Why do we live as if we're set free from our own sin? And the answer is, is because of what Jesus has done for us. You see, I am a United States citizen. That's how people would see me. But when I look in the mirror and I see myself, I belong to something much bigger and something much more important. And even though the United States of America may disappoint me, may let me down, I will not let my life be determined by the United States of America. My life will be determined by Jesus Christ. And this is such an important teaching in living as strangers. Look what, um, look what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11. Turn there with me. It talks about the people of faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Noah, how they lived in lands and times and and certain places. They lived in the land of Canaan. They lived in Israel. They lived in Babylon. They lived in Assyria and many other nations. Right now, we could even say this for us. We live in the United States of America, right? But look look what Hebrews 11 says. All of these people were still living by faith when they died, right? They were following God when they died, no matter what. They did not receive the things that were promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. So as Abraham's living in the land of Canaan, he is looking at something far more important. It is not the dirt that he's standing on, but it is something greater. Look what else it says. It says in verse 14, uh, excuse me, continuing verse 13, uh, it says, admitting that they were what? Foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. Wait a second. I thought God promised the land of Israel to Abraham. He did. But Abraham knew that his life and his journey and his country was much bigger than the land of Israel. Look what else it says. Continuing in verse 15. If they had been thinking of a country they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return Instead, they were longing for a better country, a what? A heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. One of the things that I hold on to in this time of political chaos is that even though I'm going to try to influence the country to stand up for morality and truth, I belong to something much greater and much larger, and that's the kingdom of God. I am not defined by being an American citizen, and neither are you. 
We are defined by our relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's something that people all across the world can unite on. That although we have dual citizenship, I belong to America, I belong to something much more important that has my allegiance hands down no matter what, and that is a heavenly country. Peter talks about this a little bit more. This idea of living as strangers and foreigners. He says in, in 1 Peter 1.17, Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Again, in 1 Peter 2.11, he says, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers, abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, do what? Glorify God in the day of visitation. Rick, why don't you smoke weed even though it may become illegal? Well, I can tell you why. Because it pollutes my mind, it distorts my thoughts, and I want to be a follower of Jesus. Rick, why don't you get drunk? I mean, you're over the age of 21. Drinking's fun. Getting drunk's a hilarious thing to do. Go out drinking with your buddies and get smashed up. Why don't you do that? Well, I belong to a heavenly country. And even though the law says I can drink and get intoxicated all I want to, I'm not going to because I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, Rick, why don't you just have sex with anybody that you want to? I mean, the law says even though you're married and you don't have to do that, you don't have to abstain from having sex with other people, why do you remain faithful to one woman? Because I belong to a heavenly country. And we could talk about that with anything. Our law allows us to do certain things in the United States, but it is our allegiance and our following of Jesus, being set free from our sin, that gives us the ability to live a free life. And this is something that we should passionately pursue, that we should pursue with all of our heart and all of our mind, because all of these things are wrapped up in this. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. So here's the key phrase. The call to live as strangers and foreigners is really a call to holiness because eternity is at stake. We are living a message of God's glory to those around us. That's why we obey the law. That's why we follow Jesus. That's why we live as foreigners and strangers and aliens in this United States of America. God is calling on us. God is challenging us. And you know something else that's interesting? Christians are the only people that pray for those who they completely disagree with. (laughs) Christians are the only people that I know who will walk up and treat people with love for those whom they disagree with. Watching Christian debates is one of my favorite things to do. William Lane Craig, he's one of my favorite guys to watch because he debates atheists who hate God and mock God and put God down, yet he has love and respect and appreciation for everyone that he comes into contact with. Why should Christians be so different? Paul told this to Timothy, right? And this is a challenge. That's why I've I've prayed for Barack Obama since the time he came into office, and I'll continue to pray for our next president, regardless of who I agree or disagree with. Why? Because I'm a follower of Jesus. Look what Timothy, uh, Paul writes to Timothy. He says in 1 Timothy 2, 1, first of all then, I urge you uh, to treat and pray with petitions and thanksgivings that they may be made on behalf of all men, for kings and for all who are in authority, so that we may lead what? A tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Man, we should be praying. If you're not praying for the next president, you need to start. If you're not praying for your local leaders, your Senate representatives, you need to start. If you get discouraged because you're so fed up with the corrupt and, and the abuse and the negligence, you should pray. I was reading uh, an online article, and one person posted in the comment section, all you Christians want to do is pray. Why don't you get up and do something about it? The world doesn't understand. We will do something about it. We will act, but we must pray. We must petition and give thanks to God for what he's done in our own life. You see, simply put, in this idea of being set free and loosing your chains, we think maybe the next president will, will just do that for us. Maybe just the next best job or the next best thing when the reality is God has already given you the key. You see, you could live in a country like Paul did, Rome. He was beheaded for following Jesus. He was put in in chains for following Jesus. He did nothing wrong. And yet, he was able to say, obey the government, obey God, be set free. You see, that's what's so radical about Christianity. Only a Christian locked up in prison beneath the ground could say, I am free. I'm living a free life. That's what God wants for you. 
That's, God, that's what God wants for, for our lives. And uh, I want to I share a story with you that some of you may have heard from me before. Um, but you can go look it up online. There, there are missionaries um, in 1732. Uh, they were called uh, Moravian missionaries. And they had this, this challenge on their heart to live for God and to spread the truth and uh, slavery was very prominent at this time, as many of you know. And so these slave traders and these slave owners were stealing people from Africa and transporting them to the Caribbean to work. Terrible, terrible thing. One of the best things that we could ever do as a country is to stand up against slavery. And slavery still goes on. Sex slavery and, tra- and tra- human trafficking. But in 1732, these, these missionaries, uh, Johan was one and David was the other, they felt called to minister to these African slaves who were being stolen and taken from their families and their country. And so they went to the Denmark government and uh, they said, we want to we sell ourselves into slavery to go minister to these people. Can you imagine that? Going to your local government and saying, I give you everything, sign me up, pay for me to go on this boat because I am going to minister to these people who need Jesus. I think that is powerful. And you know what the government said? They said no. They said no because you're white and white people aren't supposed to be slaves. Terrible, absolutely disgraceful. And so they petitioned to the queen of Denmark and they petitioned to her government and her court and they said, we want to be sold into slavery because we want to sail on this boat and win these people for Jesus Christ. And the queen said no. And they were determined. They were determined to share God's love with the people around them And so um, they sold their possessions and they found a boat that took them to the Caribbean and they worked as carpenters and they lived a very low life, terribly low life. But yet their mission work led to the baptism of over 13,000 people. The Caribbean is some of the most religious country that you ever go to. People are very spiritual there, all because people were willing to say, I give up my right to be called a citizen of Denmark. And I am willing to give up everything to follow God, to share his message with the people around us. You want to talk about loyalty and true godliness. That's what God is calling for us. And as they sailed out from the dock, it is reported that they said this, may the lamb who was slain receive the reward of his suffering. You see, they weren't looking to Denmark to rule their life. We're not looking to the United States to rule our life. We are looking unto Jesus who gave up everything. And may our lives reflect that type of sacrifice. You see, you belong to a heavenly country if you are in Christ. You belong to Jesus because of the price that he paid. Ephesians chapter 2 says this. It says, but now Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, have been brought near by what? The blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments contained in these ordinances, so that in himself he might make two into one new man, thus establishing peace. No more Jews and Gentiles, no more black and white, no more woman and man, but one. That's what Jesus did. And it says in verse uh, 16 that he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross and by it having been put to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to those who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through in him we have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you who are no longer strangers and aliens But you are what? Fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. To transfer your citizenship from the United States of America to the heavenly Jerusalem means that you're no longer a stranger and a foreigner to God, that you are part of his household. You belong. You don't have to pass a test. You don't have to recite a certain number of words. In order to do that, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, 38, repent, turn away from your sins, be baptized into Christ Jesus, and you will receive the remission of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
That's what it means to belong to the kingdom, that you can follow God and be set free from your sin. And that's why we're getting ready to partake in the Lord's Supper. It's because a man was willing to give up his right in heaven, to come down to this earth, to live, to suffer, and to die that we might live. He sold himself into the punishment of our sin so that we could have freedom, so that we could be set free to live. I am thankful that I live in this country. I am thankful that I have the rights that I do. But more importantly than that, I am thankful that Jesus died for me. You're going to get a, a, a cup of juice, which is the blood of Jesus. You're going to get a little piece of bread, which is the body. And as you drink that cup, and as that cracker smashes between your teeth, I want you to think about how Jesus' body was broken on that cross. When those nails were shoved through his hands, when the whips were against his back, when the crown of thorns was impressed into his skull, I want you to think about how God broke himself that you could belong to his home. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for creating a city that we could live, a city that we could dwell in. It's not Severn, Maryland. It's not Glen Burnie. It's not the surrounding areas. It's your, it's your dwelling place, Lord. God, thank you for giving us the right to be called citizens and friends. God, thank you for loving us so much that you were willing to pour out your blood and break your body that we might live. God, I pray that as we take this cup and this bread, that we'll remember we have been set free from the bondage of sin and death, that we may be thrown in jail, we may lose our jobs, we may be persecuted, but yet we are so very free. Thank you for loving us, Lord. Thank you for dying for us. Strengthen us, empower us to live for you, that when people look at us, we can tell them about Jesus. God, we love you, and it's in your name that we pray.